And then they took a pun on Wilson's phrase from 1917. They said it would mean that national self-determination had been withheld when the Arabs were a majority in Palestine and only conceded when the Jews were, were a majority. It would mean that the Arabs had been denied the opportunity of standing by themselves, that they had in fact, after an interval of conflict, been bartered about from Turkish sovereignty to Jewish sovereignty. Now, I just want to deal with um, the, a few interesting issues that came out of the 1948 conflict. I'm not going to go into all the details of what happened there, um, and I'll briefly mention the refugee issue, but I want to focus on the border issue, because I still think it's, it's an interesting one, and one that's still even raised by the Israelis today, who often say that the 1949 ceasefire lines are not permanent boundaries and they're still open to negotiation. Of course, Israelis are arguing with a view to um, redrawing the boundaries taken to, uh, to, to incorporate the large settlement blocks um, into Israel, which, which, would, which raises difficulties because those settlements are considered contrary to international law, as the International Court uh, explained it uh, f six years ago in its advisory opinion. But what's interesting is that when, when, when the State of Israel declared its independence, they specifically cited the um, UN partition plan. And in fact, if you read the text, you'll see that it refers to the UN partition plan. But not only that, but the provisional government of Israel's um, ambassador in Washington, when they cabled Truman, again, raised the issue. They said that... Uh, I have the honor to notify you that the State of Israel was proclaimed as an independent republic within frontiers approved by the General Assembly of the United Nations in its resolution of, of November the 29th, 1947, namely the partition plan. But when we look at the same map I showed you earlier, this is a bit closer up map, I want you to look at the, the red line this time. These are the 1949 ceasefire lines. The orange area is supposed to be part of the Arab state. You can see that at the end of the hostilities, Israel had acquired a substantial uh, chunk of the envisaged Arab state, bearing in mind that the, the, the Arabs had already thought that the UN partition plan was unfair because it awarded, awarded the majority of the territory to the envisaged Jewish state. In fact, if you look at the, uh, if it hadn't been uh, for the Battle of Latrun <coughs> um, with the Arab Legion, that was uh, Transjordan's army, we, uh, held back an attack from the Haganah and the Ergen. We may not even have a, a West Bank today. But the point is that the, what's interesting is that the, the negotiation process a year later in Lausanne in 1949, the Americans picked up this point. Uh, they picked up the border issue and the refugee issue. And they basically told the Israelis, if you've accepted the UN partition plan in good faith, that plan had specific provisions for minorities and borders. And then they were saying that the in, in the interest of a just and equitable solution of, of, of this, these problems, then Israel should be expected to offer territorial compensation for any territorial acquisitions which it expected to affect beyond the borders. So if Israel didn't want to withdraw from the territories that it acquired, then it was expected to offer compensation elsewhere to the envisaged Arab state, so that would be viable, etc. They also made the point about refugees that the UN partition plan spoke of 400 to 450,000 Arabs living in the Jewish state. Only 150,000 Arabs were left after 1949. So the Americans are saying, if you really are keen on the UN partition plan, you have to at least allow those who, who are envisaged in the plan as living in Israel as a minority to return. To cut a long story short, the, the, um, the peace plan got nowhere and Israel uh, refused to come to an agreement and we are still living with the consequences today, the refugee issue and the borders issue are still so-called final sta status issues, as is the status of, of Jerusalem. Um, and this is linked to the, my final point as to why so many peace plans are founded. Um, the Palestinians usually argue that well, one of the reasons is that all the issues that are germane, that are important to them, they namely Jerusalem, uh, access to water, borders, refugees, have never been, well, they've, they've been subject to negotiation, although no agreement has yet uh, uh, they've come to no real uh, substantive agreement. But usually what happens is international law is set aside. So, you know, the refugees can't return, even if they have a right under international law, because this would affect the demographic character of Israel. And, um, you know, the boundary issue, okay, they probably, you might have an argument on 1948, but the reality is that Israel has acquired uh, population centers in the West Bank, and you have to take to, into account facts on the ground. So what essentially happens is international law is kind of set, set aside whereas in other cases it may not necessarily be, be so. The second point I think is quite important, and it's that is, there's this culture of, of blame the Israelis-Palestinians continue to see each other, 
as enemies and in the short term you can understand that but if you have a longer trajectory you could perhaps understand that neither of them were, were essentially fighting hundreds of years ago and if it hadn't again been for the role of Britain manufacturing this conflict they wouldn't have been fighting in the first place um, and indeed many Jews lived in the Arab world prior to the to the emergence of Zionism and then again the point is if the two-state solution looks very un unrealistic when as long as the settlements are allowed to to expand um, and there's another reason and this was raised this is my last my last slide and I'll give you the last quote and this was this is interesting because it was raised by Philip Jessup some of you might know him, he's named after him, a moot court competition is named after him. He was a professor of international law at Columbia University for many years, and he also became uh, the uh, US uh, judge at the International Court of Justice. And reflecting back on his years when he also served as the US representative to the United Nations when the State of Israel declared its independence, he made the following observation in his memoirs, which he called The Birth of Nations. And he said that neither, neither I nor my advisors at the United Nations in New York had ever been told that it was a president's policy to recognize the State of Israel. Our official information in the delegation had been to the contrary. Diplomacy by surprise is a dangerous practice. It may be useful from the point of view of domestic politics, but it can be ruinous to our relations with other countries. And he was talking about the role of, of special interest groups, which, which um, although they're not as uh, significant then as they are today, they, they were still active, or smaller groups were active, especially during the passage of the UN 1947 UN partition plan, and it was an election year in uh, 48 um, when Harry Truman was re-elected. Um, that's I'm going to conclude with my talk there. This is my website. If if you're interested in in reading any more articles, or if you are not able to acquire the book today, you can also purchase it through my website. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And thank you very much for for listening to me. May I? Uh, I have two related questions. You commented on the um, mandate being incorporated into the, or rather the Balfour Declaration being incorporated into the mandate. That was at San Remo, I believe, in 1922. And you mentioned that that, that made the mandate, uh, the declaration binding. Um, given the equivocal and ambiguous language of the declaration, exactly what was Britain bound to? My second question is, um, after the war, that is the, the Second World War. The Arab League wanted to, I believe there was a resolution introduced in the General Assembly to um, have the question of who should be the natural sovereign in Palestine referred to the International Court of Justice. Um, there was some question about the, the Arabs had a question about the legality of the UN disposing of Palestine. Um, it was thought the natural sovereign should be the Palestinian Arab people um, that it never happened. Uh, the resolution was not approved. The determination was never made. So what really was the, in your view, the legal status of the, the UN's disposition of Palestine? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer these questions if they come. It's a very good question. Uh, the first one was Britain bound to, well, arguably the Balfour Declaration, which, uh, which spoke of, of establishing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, subject to the safeguard clauses. And I essentially argued that Britain didn't fully adhere to those safeguard clauses in the Balfour Declaration. Um, your second question, which is very interesting, is about actually the, um, the, Arab, uh, the Arab governments, I think it was Syria and Egypt, um, drafted a resolution, a draft resolution at the UN General Assembly, and tried to refer eight questions to the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion. And I've got all the questions uh, in the book. It's really quite interesting. Um, and these had to do with, funnily enough, the Hussein McMahon correspondence, um, whether, whether the Balfour Declaration being incorporated into the mandate conflicted with Article 22 of the League of Nations. And, and then there was also the question of whether the UN General Assembly even had the competence to partition a mandated territory. And we can all speculate on the, what the answers would have been. But what was interesting is that the last question the one whether the General Assembly had the competence to partition a mandated territory um, only failed by a single vote. Uh, the others were, 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 just, were, were kind of lost the, the, the vote in the UN General Assembly, but this last one, even France and India 
voted in favour of that question. They were actually very interested. And the, the vote didn't go through because the USSR and its satellites had this policy of not recognising the jurisdiction of the ICJ in those days, and, and they kind of opposed it. So the question was never rendered to the courts. But some American jurists writing at the time came to the conclusion that the court may have indeed have said that the, the General Assembly had no competence because it would have violated self-determination. But we can only speculate what would have happened. But it's very interesting, and it's all, it is all in my book. I have a, a chapter devoted just to the UN partition plan, and I, I, I deal with these, with these questions there. It seems to me that with the Balfour Declaration, the UK was taking possession of the Jewish problem. Why wasn't it sufficient for them simply to use immigration restriction and leave the Jews to their own devices? It's a good question. I guess because they, in those, I'm just hypothesizing. In those days, they perhaps even just because legislation was passed meant they couldn't necessarily enforce them and that people would still have come into the country despite it and perhaps they liked the idea. Well, there are two reasons why. When Herzl first went before the, the, the uh, commission, he gave two reasons. One was the domestic issue. There was also the imperial consideration. And then when I read his diaries and he's having a com uh, Herzl's having a conversation with Neville Chamberlain, he raises the issue of immigration, but he also says that then Britain can use the Jewish state, uh, what he calls a buffer state for the British Empire. So he was arguing that it would serve two British interests, a domestic one and a foreign relations one, an imperial one. And that's how he kind of argued it. Um, yeah. uh, thank you. I highly commend you for your uh, floodlight on the British imperialism and how it ruled uh, this corner of the world. But then you said that you want uh, to cut uh, the long story short, and you cut the most interesting parts, uh, which probably serves uh, some agenda. But if, you <laughs> but if you look at the whole story, and you take uh, uh, Yasser Arafat speech, which he took from the King Solomon, you would say that the child of Palestine was already dismembered. Its uh, right hand and left hand were amputated by the British, and uh, the kingdom of some uh, imported king was created on the Palestinian territory. Then the British proceeded to cut their uh, left hand and right, which is Peel Commission and so on. Uh, so it should be put in, in this perspective. And then it should be also mentioned that Arabs uh, all along uh, were not uh, kind of happy, but they chose uh, the weak target, uh, like it happened during immigration uh, to the United States. Uh, like Italians uh, were choosing uh, blacks as a target, not at the Anglo-Saxon masters. So Arabs didn't uh, choose uh, British uh, imperialist army uh, as their target, but they chose Jews as their target and uh, for Jews instead. This uh, should be, I think, part of your discourse. And, uh, 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 okay, it's probably uh, enough. And uh, we have uh, to, uh, we have to uh, not to omit the uh, most interesting part uh, of the story, as you did, and you slide or glide through history. So, yeah. can Thank you comment sure, on sure. this? Thank you. Thank you. Well, because I only have, well, I didn't go for everything in the book. It's quite a large book, so I was very select. I had to be selective for time reasons over what I what I decided to talk about, and I thought some of the issues that I raised might not be as well known as as the other issues. Um, I don't quite agree entirely. I, I agree with you that the Zionist movement did target Jews, but in fact the major revolt, 1936 to 1939, the so-called three-year revolt, specifically targeted on the whole mainly British soldiers. And indeed Britain had to send, I think, 30,000 troops to quell the disturbance. And in fact, a lot of Arab historians have said that one of the reasons why the Haganah was so successful in 1948 is they had suppressed this revolt 
in, in the late 1930s, and the Arab national movement had never fully recovered. 